uh, first, uh, let me get invite up uh, Kathleen uh, Ham, who was part of the uh, Spectrum Policy Task Force and is now uh, at uh, T-Mobile. Um, I also invite up uh, Evan Pearl, who is still at the FCC 20 years later and was part of the Spectrum Policy Task Force and still does Spectrum Policy at uh, uh, the FCC. And, uh, oh, come on. Tell us a lot about the FCC. You wouldn't be here if it weren't for the FCC. Um, and uh, last, I want to uh, call up uh, uh, Ruth uh, Milkman, who was in practice, but not uh, at the FCC at the time, the Spectrum Policy Task Force, but anyone who is familiar with Spectrum and Spectrum Policy is very well aware of Ruth's uh, career and uh, contributions to Spectrum uh, Policy, including at the FCC uh, uh, during the Obama administration, and uh, um, now uh, in uh, private practice uh, once again. So thank you all very much for uh, uh, joining us today. So Chris posed this as the, the report as the, the flux capacitor, although I'd also ask, is it the DeLorean, um, which you know, looked really cool, but didn't really you know, go anywhere in the real world. Uh, I like to think that the, uh, this report, and I actually agree with the comments that uh, Meredith made, that this report uh, had uh, uh, an enormous role in creating the wireless world of today, and in part, uh, to appreciate that, let me uh, uh, ask uh, uh, folks here. Uh, so, what do you think? Can you, what What would you want to remind people about what the wireless world was like in 2002, including from a policy perspective? What were these policies that weren't keeping up uh, with the um, market uh, demand? Why was 2002? Uh, an important time to be uh, to be doing this. Let me uh, uh, start with uh, Ruth at this end, and we'll uh, we'll work down to uh, Kathleen. Thanks, Sarah. Turn it on. Um, so I looked at this, the 2003 CMRS competition report to remind myself of what the sort of basic facts were in 2002. Their subscribership at that point was 141.8 million mobile subscribers compared to Kathleen Kinsall's what it is today, but <laughs> it's a lot it's, more. It's, 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 more than double. More than double. <laughs> Nationwide penetration was only 49%. It's now well over 100%. 97%. Um, and, and only 8% of those people who were subscribed to mobile service subscribed to some kind of mobile service so it's what um, Commissioner Baker said is people were very focused on voice at the time and only 20% used text messaging or uh, of, of that group. Wi-Fi was just beginning to play a role in hotspots but was nowhere near as ubiquitous. And part of this I think uh, you you asked Carol about the, the policy. We were still very much in a old, you know, in the transition we're still in a transition from the old command and control way of organizing spectrum to the market-based approach and the auctions flexible use have been around for a decade or more um, and the auctions had started only eight years before I guess right 1994 yeah so it, it was still pretty early on in in transitioning to a more market-based one of the reasons that the report setting up the orientation towards markets was important. Well, of course, I agree with everything that we said. <laughs> I know better than to disagree, but she also, there's a reason for agreeing because she's usually right. Um, so let me just, Ruth um, focused on things that are different. And, I would say, I want to focus on things that are the same. Um, one of the things that are the same was the view that there was a 
growing demand for spectrum and that the supply wasn't keeping up. And I just want to um, take a quote from the Spectrum Policy Task Force, which you could use it now. It says, there has been a dramatic increase in overall demand for spectrum-based services and devices, accompanied by particular demand for mobile and portable spectrum-based applications. This is true for both traditional licensed services and services offered to unlicensed devices. I mean, that, you, know, you could put that in a report now and it would be the same. So, you know, while the technology has changed, you know, 3G was, was, was the latest thing then and 5G is now being built out and, um, and but the, the pressure to expand capacity you know, through getting more spectrum and through new technologies is, is still the same. So there's a lot that feels the same. I'll, I'll stop with that. Yeah, I would agree. There is, looking back at the report, I just, it just struck me how many things are still still the same. But the technology has evolved dramatically since 2002. I mean, if you think about, you know, Meredith's flip phone, that was the cool phone of the day. Uh, we didn't have smartphones. Everybody was using 2G. There was a lot of talk about 3G. And even if you had 3G, it was a walled garden. It wasn't really a real connection to the internet. Um, you know, you had some new competition emerging with AT&T and Bell Atlantic, now Verizon. Wi-Fi uh, was in its very early stages and certainly wasn't in your phone. Um, we had a lot of success with the, with the early auctions and it's interesting, since 2002, um, the auctions have raised nearly $200 billion for the U.S. Treasury, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, and at the time, everybody was talking about um, spectrum below, well, three gigahertz was the cool spectrum band. Now, you know, we're talking about mobile use as high as 12 gigahertz and beyond. So the technology has definitely evolved um, dramatically since 2002. So a lot of things the same, but, but I think the technology has driven a lot of uh, new uses, uh, and benefits. So, as someone who was working, you know, and was fairly new to the public interest community at the time, um, one of the things that was true then was that basically the organizations that two public interest organizations that were working on this, um, Media Access Project uh, and uh, New America Foundation, and the two people who were working on this uh, were mostly me and Michael Calabrese. Uh, our organization, I've, I've moved to PK, and they now call that piece of uh, New America Foundation OTI, uh, but uh, that is one element that I think unfortunately has not changed nearly as much as it, uh, um, as it could. But uh, one thing I can say as somebody who is in the public interest community outside and where unlicensed spectrum was just bursting on the scene. Um, we take Wi-Fi for granted, we take Bluetooth for granted, um, but uh, this, one of the things that I, I think that was really important about what was going on was what we used to call the property school versus the commons school as a philosophy. And there were huge shouting matches and ideological wars over this. I mean, it was really like you'd get together in these conference rooms, we will bury you um, kind of things. Um, for those who believe that, uh, and, and I will say that, you know, as somebody who was in the unlicensed, um, you know, camp at the time, um, the uh, concern that we had was that the fix was in, um, that this was basically going to be the triumphant march of uh, uh, licenses as property, and uh, but it turned out, you know, that it was a pretty balanced and nuanced report. Um, so I, I'd like to ask, you know, Evan uh, uh, and Kathleen, as people were inside. Um, did people come in with a particular set of expectations and then as you dug into it, things changed? Was it, uh, um, you know, what, to the extent that uh, uh, you can declassify some of this stuff and, uh, uh, you know, fill us in on the hot gossip 20 years later, um, what was it like on the inside in terms of 
the understanding of what uh, Chairman Powell was trying to accomplish here? Were there particular things that people really wanted to see? How did that, you know, work out to the best uh, uh, that you can, uh, you know, tell us? Well, uh, Pal had brought in Paul Kaladze from DARPA, um, and for those who don't know DARPA, DARPA is kind of the think tank of DOD. They innovated, I think they claim they created the internet. But, um, and so he was a big think kind of guy, and uh, he really wanted to sort of uh, break the glass and, and uh, do some different things. I will say, just for my own bias at the time, uh, the auctions program had been tremendously successful at the FCC, uh, really setting up a market-based uh, solution for allocating and assigning spectrum. And um, I, for sure, uh, sitting on the, on the task force, wanted to make sure that that was definitely part of the equation. I think at the time, there was a lot of interest in also unlicensed and some other uh, ideas that maybe we'll talk about but never really went anywhere, um, like interference temperature. But uh, for the most part, I think there was, you know, all ideas, there are no bad ideas, all ideas are on the table. Uh, a lot of people came to the table understanding that auctions have been a big success, but, you know, what else could we do um, to improve spectrum management? And at the time, I would also say, you know, NTIA was not part of this discussion, and I think Meredith might have mentioned, but it really was only the following year that there was an MOU between the FCC and NTIA on spectrum management, which I think uh, was a really important development, but not that sort of coordination was not part of the part of the report. I must say that I agree completely with uh, Kathleen, which reminds me of the old joke about uh, congressional speeches that everything has been said, but not everybody has said it. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll uh, earn my keep here and uh, go over some of the same things that uh, Kathleen said. So one of the questions that um, Harold asked about were, you know, what were uh, Powell's goals? And, and I think you know, one goal was promoting greater access to spectrum. And, he, and I think he was very uh, practical and eclectic about how to do that. He, you know, he understood you know, the, the um, license model, but there was also this um, opportunity for um, unlicensed devices and opportunistic um, access. But the, 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 there was a lot of concern that not all the, there was a great demand for spectrum, but not all spectrum was available. Not all spectrum was, was being used, and, and it couldn't be used for various uh, institutional reasons. But the second thing was that he wanted to increase efficiency of use and, and put spectrum to the highest value uses. And I think he you know, believed that markets do something; they do something useful. Um, so. You know, th I think those were the, the objectives. But as far as, so I think Paul Colazzi was brought in by you know, Powell to, to deal with the first issue, promoting greater access um, to spectrum. And, and you know, the hope was that uh, you know, you know, through new technologies, whether you know, software-defined radio, dynamic spectrum um, uh, access, uh, that Spectrum that wasn't being used could be used without causing uh, harmful interference to any of the incumbents. So, one of one of his um, innovations that that um, Kathleen mentioned that didn't go anywhere was this this interference temperature concept, and it was the idea of allowing um, use of spectrum below the noise floor, so that he would first establish you know, what the interference environment was, or a noise floor, and, 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 and then he would wanted to have ubiquitous devices measuring this in real time, and then allowing opportunistic use of licensed spectrum, you know, by uh, unlicensed devices subject to a cap 
climate interference temperature. It sounded like a good idea. I was never uh, um, convinced that it was workable. And um, I think, well, that there were a lot of other people who were unconvinced. But, um, <laughs> but in any case, it, but it was, it was an interesting idea. And I give, I, I, I give um, Chairman Powell credit for being open to new ideas. You know, I mean, you, you know, the whole thing, if, if, if you're not willing to fail, you're never going to you know, do anything new. So, you know, it, and, and Palazzi was a smart guy, and Dorothy had done a lot of great things. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that is frequently underappreciated, um, and that, uh, you know, what, uh, Meredith Baker alluded to the U.S., you know, being a global leader and continuing to be a global leader, uh, I think that people don't really appreciate how much innovation in policy, especially in an area like Spectrum, where every aspect of it, from who gets to use what and how, at what powers and what purposes, how much that really depends on innovative public policy. Uh, and you know, when we look at the the report today, uh, I think uh, that we would agree that thematically um, it holds up very well and has contributed to the success of the current wireless technology. This idea of moving away from command and control, relying more on market mechanisms, enhancing spectrum access um, are all things that have really driven uh, the uh, you know, spectrum policy and therefore spectrum expansion. Uh, and here more so than in any other country. I mean, you know, we all in the U.S. love to, to pat ourselves on the back, but you know, the fact is that unlicensed spectrum started here, um, and that's why Wi-Fi yeah, started here. Spectrum auctions started here, and that's why we were the first to deploy nationwide wireless networks. Um, you know, uh, I can go on with other things, but uh, um, you know that. Innovation is important. Um, Evan, you, you touched on this with interference temperature, though, and Lord knows I'm getting ready to do my receiver standard NOI comments for next Monday. So, just to, to put it uh, um, to, uh, to Ruth and, and Kathleen, what do you think we missed? You know, what were some of the, the, the DeLoreans as opposed to the flux capacitors? Um, of the spectrum report, and why, and for all of you, why do these problems still persist today? Because, you know, if we're bringing up receiver standards 20 years later, there has to be a reason for that. And are they the same reasons? Are they different reasons? Was it institutional uh, issues? What do you think uh, um, is the reason we keep uh, coming back to some of these things? There, uh, there are no new ideas, just recycled ideas I, on, on some level. That, that seems to be true with, with uh, spectrum policy. But receiver standards were, were an issue. They continue to be an issue. And I reason I think a lot of the problems persist was I think I, I recall a memo coming out of the general counsel's office of the FCC at the time saying that maybe there was an legal authority. Um, and in fact, Congress gave uh, for the digital transition specifically gave uh, the SEC authority to regulate receiver standards. So there is a question mark about, I think, uh, the legal authority. And obviously, there are a lot of devices out there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not an easy task to, uh, to pull all that back. And uh, so it, it, is, it is hard, and I think some of the harder issues are the ones that uh, continue to persist, but I, I'm really glad that the commission has taken it up today, um, and hopefully, you know, that is an issue that uh, can be tackled. But it 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 does it does present, you know, from a spectrum management standpoint, it creates some very poor incentives, I think, in the use of the spectrum. Um, you can have the the worst, sloppiest technology, and uh, you know, create the, the cheapest devices that are going to encroach on your neighbor's uh, spectrum, uh, and that seems to be, you know, 
as, as the spectrum has gotten more crowded and uh, frankly, uh, the value of it, its use uh, more, more and more important, I think these types of issues just have got to be tackled. So, but back in the day, back in 2002, I think it was, it was maybe a bit too early to do that. I think one of the, taking a step back, one of the reasons that problems persist, Kathleen is right, receiver standards in particular, the legal authority is less than crystal clear, shall we say, and, and that will be an obstacle. But we have uh, institutional problems as well. So one of the great things about the Spectrum Task Force is it was a formal way of having a cross-bureau uh, analysis and, and you know thinking about spectrum. And the FCC's bureaus, you know, the Mass Media Bureau does broadcast and the International Bureau does satellite and the Wireless Bureau does uh, not only you know the cellular services but all these private services that you guys that, that most of the time you don't think about a aviation, maritime, etc. And for the first time in this spectrum task force all the parts of the commission came together to think collectively about spectrum and that set the stage for future efforts like the spectrum chapter of the national broadband plan like the incentive auction task force that i think is really important and it also sort of i think i wasn't there at the time but i'll i'll conjecture that it also got people in the habit of talking to each other more right the other big institutional problem is the FCC and TIA split. I think that the United States, I am told that the United States is the only country in the world that has this kind of division in the way it manages spectrum. That most countries um, have a, a single spectrum authority that deals with both spectrum used by their governments and spectrum used by commercial users. I, I'm not anticipating that this is going to change anytime soon, but it does create particular barriers to um, the kind of national spectrum strategy development and implementation that I think we all agree that we need. I, I would totally agree with that, and I do think the NTIA FCC coordination is really, really important, and it's especially important today because there is no low-hanging fruit in spectrum anymore. It's going to get harder and harder to, to mine for the spectrum that's needed. Um, and so I think a lot of the, the government agencies, whether it's FAA or DOD or NOAA, have kind of woken up and now are going to defend their spectrum turf and more than they've done in the past. So I think that's a, an increasing area of the need for greater coordination between the two, two agencies because obviously, you know, there's a balance that has to occur there. But, um, you know, I understand NTIA uh, and the FCC are negotiating yet a new MOU, one that from 2003, uh, so it looks like it needs to be updated, I think, and I think that's a that's a great uh, a great thing. Yeah. So this raises another question that I wanted to ask because you know if we read the report, there were a bunch of things that we would say today. Wow, how did you not talk about this? And one of these is the interagency coordination uh, uh, issue, and. You know, as we heard from uh, Meredith Baker, NTIA actually did its own report, um, which also was, um, you know, enthusiastic about, uh, you know, echoed many of the themes that were in the Spectrum uh, Task Force uh, report. But what does it say about how these decisions were being made 20 years ago that the Spectrum Policy Task Force didn't really get a, um, feel they needed to touch on uh, interagency coordination. And if we were gonna have a spectrum policy task force today, how would you wanna see that handled? I mean, would it be you know inviting in uh, uh, other agencies? Would it be uh, um, 
you know, and making them part of a team? Would it be consultations? How would you, uh, uh, you know, perhaps want to see that handled differently uh, today? Anybody want to start? Or? Well, I, I do think it's, I think they mentioned in the report briefly the need to coordinate with NTIA, but NTIA obviously wasn't at the table. And I do think that that's really, really important because like I said, there's no real low hanging fruit in uh, spectrum um, anymore. So the, the stuff that's out there is gonna be hard to work with and it's gonna require you know, coordination and um, and smart smart technology use, um, you know. So that's something that I think you have to have NTIA at the table, and with a strong administrator, uh, you know, NTIA hasn't had an administrator now for a couple of years, really. Uh, they've just had an active. So having somebody uh, in that role. Um, as a strong administrator, I think, um, I think is important too. So I can't, I don't have a solution um, to this, this, this issue, but I just wanted to um, note something that most of you are already aware of, but some may not be, that some of the most serious um, Problems, things that didn't work well recently, you know, have to do with um, perhaps a lack of, 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 of coordination. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking of um, the whole C band um, um, issue with with um, um, these radar-based altimeters in airplanes, and it just seemed that this should have been worked out before. So, I mean, I'm not the first or the last one to say we need better coordination, but I think it's a sort of interesting um, point to make that the, the whole receiver issue, um, you know, is, is you know, this interference. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the heart of the spectrum policy is interference. And, you know, if we can't coordinate interference on adjacent bands, we've got a real problem. And you know, all I can say is, um, you know, there, there has to be, you know, more than just um, talk. I think there has to be some kind of, um, you know, binding rules that, you know, create greater compatibility and allow the uh, spectrum to be repurposed for higher value uses, you know, with, without causing, um, you know, problems in, in adjacent bands, and, and, and it, it is a coordination problem. And also, you know, on a, a sort of a coordination uh, problem, also related to interference and, and receivers, is, is the whole um, Legato light squared um, GPS devices, um, which, which has been going on, it seems like, forever. I don't know if that's 20 years, but not, but probably not, but, but it feels like it. <laughs> Um, and you know, there it's a, it's a very complicated problem, you know, to, to, to deal with because you have these GPS um, devices that are not controlled, you know, by the the um, a, you know a system manager like like in a, a, a system operator like a cellular um, a mobile system, um, and and you know there were decisions that were made. In, in, in terms of you know, what the power would be for GPS that affects the built the, the um, um, sensitivity of GPS devices to interference, there, there were issues that that they that these um, GPS devices um, actually use um, GPS transmissions, which are outside of the, the band, in order to increase the the accuracy of of their um, um, the determination of location. And, you know, these things, I don't think were ever, you know, coordinated, you know, with, with, with the FCC. And, and, and this also brings me to something that perhaps we'll talk about later, which is, 
you know, you know, looking forward, and Harold's going to ask about this, but the, the whole notion of future-looking regulation is, is something that, that we really need. And you see this, that you know, when the decisions are made, you know, how, how to structure a system, there's typically no thought about you know, what, what the future might look like. I mean, we, you know, you know as, as many people, including Yogi Berra said, uh, prediction is hard to do, especially about the future. So, <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it's better to try, and, and we could do a little better than just assuming the world is gonna look the way, exactly the way it does today. And, 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 and so, you know, one, one of my uh, uh, hobby horses is, is that we need a, a um, and this is something that I've worked on with John Williams, he, he probably deserves credit, um, which is for, for interference robustness, we need a path towards creating incentives for growing robustness of systems to interference over time and having that expectation when, when, when equipment is manufactured, when, when systems designs are made, that there's going to be uh, perhaps a different interference environment in which they're going to have to operate. And you don't have to be a genius to see that, you know, probably, you know, mobile devices, there's going to be more spectrum for mobile devices, you know, with the cellular architecture and so on. And that somehow you should be expecting to, to have such a system adjacent to you and be able to deal with it. And, and you don't now, and it leads to lots of problems. But let me stop there. So, Another place where I think there is not as much discussion or virtually no discussion in the report that would be very different today is on the international market and, and international fora such as the ITU or the regional uh, spectrum uh, conferences. Um, uh, part of that I think reflects the world as it was in 2002 um, where uh, we just didn't pay as much attention uh, to that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, what do you think would be different today in terms of a discussion of the impact of, you know, international and the relationship between the, you know, first of all, how do you all think we thought about it then in 2002, this relationship of the FCC and spectrum policy and um, international uh, spectrum uh, uh, bodies and standard setting bodies and how do you think it would be different if we were writing the uh, the, the report today? <laughs> Anybody want to start? <laughs> well, there, there was a lot of talk about, I think, global harmonization of bands and that sort of thing. And I think those things still uh, persist. I'm not an international expert, but I do think uh, that's an issue that we, you know, continue to have uh, challenges with. And I think, you know, I think somebody mentioned, you know, we were the first to have mobile technology, the first to do auctions, um, the first to deploy the internet, you know. Uh, other, other countries now have woken up and they're doing the same and they're demanding, um, you know, use of spectrum as well. And, um, and a lot of that also, you know, it impacts the satellite world as well, not just uh, not just mobile. So it is really important for the U.S. to be involved in these international bodies and to get their point of view. Um, I know right now the ITU, for example, uh, Doreen Bakken Martin is the U.S. candidate. There's a Russian candidate, as I understand, uh, running for that role, and. Um, I think it's it's really important from a standard setting uh, point of view that the U.S. you know really have a strong uh, position because we stand for things that some of the countries don't. <laughs> I think in terms of openness and um, and um, efficiency of spectrum use and the like. So um, if we had to do it today, I just think it probably should be part of the part of the report in a, in a bigger way than it was back in 2002. So I think at the time, the international focus for spectrum was much more on satellite and government spectrum than it was on wireless spectrum. The, uh, in the US in this time period, 
more or less had decided it could go it alone. So in if the the one of the reasons the PCS spectrum was controversial, I don't know Evan if you guys remember this, was the FCC had just gone through this whole thing at the work preceding work to make the spectrum available for mobile. That's the World Radio services. Conference for those who aren't oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the World Radio Conference to do, and I don't. You which one it was, but no, we went through this whole thing. The U.S. went through this whole thing to make it um, mobile satellite spectrum, and then turned around and decided, no, no, it should be what became personal PCS, PCS. the you know the uh, one of what is now one of the big workhorse bands for right. the mobile providers, and then with 700, the FCC did it again. This was after the Spectrum Policy Task Force, but the FCC just decided on its own band plan for 700 megahertz and, you know, hoped that other countries would follow and some did and some didn't. And it didn't, you know, the FCC, I think, had taken the position that the U.S. was a big enough market that it could do what it thought was right and didn't have to um, follow, the rest of the world. follow the rest of the world and the rest of the world would, would follow them. So. I have this uh, perhaps um, not, um, uh, well, I won't characterize it, but, but my perspective is on it, for the international stuff, aside from global harmonization of bands, which is important to the price of equipment, yeah. it is still very unclear to me why, with respect to terrestrial services, the FCC would worry that much about international spectrum. But Evan will tell me why. Well, there is an, another exception, and something that I had something uh, involvement with. Can you hold the microphone? Oh, yes. So there, there's an exception. It's not, it's not only harmonization of uh, equipment standards, which you know affects the price of, uh, of equipment, but Canada and Mexico are on our borders, True. As, as you may be well aware. <laughs> uh, and uh, it turned out that getting a, a agreements for uh, harmonization of, of band plans with Canada and Mexico was hugely important for uh, the amount of spectrum that would be available from, uh, from uh, the broadcast incentive auction. Right. Um, so, I mean, it, it, you know, they had great, there were TV stations, you know, that are along the border and you know they, they, they had been, you know, coordinated, you know, with American stations, and that was fine. But when you want to put in a mobile service, you have to change all that, or else you, you know, either you know they're going to interfere with your mobile devices, or your mobile devices are going to interfere with, you know, with their receivers. But you've got a problem, and it, and it would foreclose the use of uh, of um, uh, 600 megahertz spectrum for uh, mobile services in a very surprisingly large area and for a surprisingly large number of people. So, you know, that that is something that is important. And, you, you, and, and you know, th th that's not the kind of stuff that they talk about at work. That was all done, you know, on a bilateral basis because, you know, what, but, there, but there was a notion, I mean, a notion I tried to, to um, you know, promote of the notion of a of a um, a uh, American band plan, you know, that was from Canada, you know, you know, through through Mexico, um, you know, that it was all harmonized, and um, you know, we, we went a long way in, in terms of achieving that. There was there was a lot of hard work um, that was done, and uh, I think there were really good results. So, and I'll just note because they're not here, but. State Department is not an agency that we think of as important uh, in spectrum policy, but obviously when we talk about these kind of bilateral uh, negotiations or uh, um, you know, uh, participation in international, uh, state is another player that uh, uh, you know, perhaps uh, we need to be more cognizant of uh, in terms of thinking about uh, spectrum policy and. Uh, how they fit into the uh, uh, into the game. Uh, one other glaring, uh, how much time do I have, by the way? Because I have, you always write more questions than you can possibly answer. How much time do I have? Uh, 20, 30 seconds. Oh, great. 
I got tons of questions in here. One of the things I want to bring up um, is time flies when you're having fun. What can I say? Um, but uh, one of the things that I, I would flag is another place where we didn't really focus on this in the Spectrum Task Force report, but was uh, I think we would very much want to focus on it today, at least I hope so, is the question of um, social justice and economic uh, justice and how spectrum policy uh, fits in with that. The attitude at the time, and I say this as somebody who was in the public interest community at the time and working with the um, you know, uh, uh, folks who were trying to use unlicensed spectrum to bring uh, connectivity to uh, um, to the you know, neighborhoods in the urban core that didn't have it and to uh, um, you know, rural tribal communities. But we didn't talk about social equity, you know, certainly not in the same way that much. There was sort of a general assumption of, well, you know, the more um, spectrums available, rising tide will lift you know, all boats, it'll, it'll all work out uh, for everyone. Um, what do you, you know, we were you know, kind of thinking about that today, um, and, I, and I, I will just add one other thing as an example of where we might think about this today, or two examples of where we might think about this today. One is the 2.5 gigahertz tribal window, um, which has been uh, an important contributor for many tribes uh, to be able to start building out and deploying their own uh, wireless networks. Uh, but the other is uh, um, the debate over the FAA uh, and uh, the C-band 5G deployment, which, you know, as I point out, where we landed was essentially low, lower power and exclusion zones around airports. Well, if you look around airports and you consider in major urban areas who lives in those neighborhoods, it tends to be poor people, people of color, because living near airports is not a lot of fun, um, and it's a continuation of a systemic, uh, um, you know, uh, racism that you know rears its head in ways that we tend not to even think about but you know what that translated to was it meant that for another year people who really need access to the capacities of 5g weren't going to get it and no one was discussing this at all so I mean maybe we ended up in the right place as a solution based on you know all the problems but no one at the time said, hey, does anybody realize that this is gonna have a disproportionate impact uh, on people of color in the urban core? Um, who, by the way, tend to be much more dependent on uh, mobile devices um, than on fixed broadband, although God knows we hope Pete and, and other uh, programs are gonna change that. Uh, so, um, I, you know, just, and you, do you think that this was a blind spot um, in the, uh, uh, you know, just in the way we looked at this in 2002, and you know, if so, how would we want to correct that uh, today? So I'll start. Um, so as you said, even the public interest groups, this wasn't. This was just kind of the general thought. This was true of the Clinton administration and doing trade agreements uh, that if you create economic. Uh, benefits, then it will help everyone across the board. And I think we just, all of us as a country, come to realize that the effects are not uniform and that they, that particular attention may need to be, needs to be given to uh, economic and social justice matters. So another way of thinking about it would be um, that you create value. And I, one of the reasons I love spectrum policy is that there's so much opportunity for value creation. And I don't just mean that in the economic venture capital sense. I mean it that, that spectrum, if you can move it to a higher and better use, it really can improve um, the lives of, of Americans in addition to creating economic value. So, but if you create additional economic value, you can then divert a portion of that value to um, to some kind of public good. And that's, I think, an, an example of this, but I think not the only example is taking a portion of auction revenues and funding FirstNet, taking a portion of auction revenues and having a digital equity fund, as the public interest groups have, have uh, suggested, or, or 
911 or public broad or funding um, public radio stations or public television stations. There are lots of um, things that could be done, uh, but in order to do it, you actually have to create the additional value first, and then it makes it possible to channel some of that value into a public good. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I would say back in that time frame too, the focus was more on uh, creating some value through the designated entity program and trying to, um, you know, make small businesses, minority, tribal organizations, owners of Spectrum, and with the idea that they would uh, create business and, um, and that would, you know, that would proliferate you know, some of that happened, some of it didn't. There's a long history behind why some of that didn't didn't work so well. But that is still in 309J of the Communications Act. There is still a mandate for the, for the FCC to do that and look for opportunities. Um, and, but I also agree that I think that overall, you know, I'll just cite a few stats here. You know, the US wireless industry contributes four, 475 billion uh, to our economy each year, uh, creating 4.7 million jobs. Um, so this is, this is more than the economies of Austria, Norway, and Israel combined, um, and, and the UAE. Uh, I know that T-Mobile spends a billion dollars a month on building out its network. Uh, in doing that, it creates jobs and opportunities. And I'm very proud of the fact, too, I know as part of the digital discrimination comments, you know, T-Mobile put in um, into the record some very good data on where we go. Um, uh, we go into neighborhoods that a lot of our competitors don't to create jobs, to provide stores, to uh, provide service. And um, so I'm glad to see the commission you know, trigger that uh, proceeding and, and get some really hard hard data. But I do think, you know, back in that day, there really was more of a focus on getting the spectrum out there into the hands of small businesses, minorities, women-owned business. Um, you know, there were things like partitioning of spectrum too, which was an idea to actually try to create smaller areas because it turned out the spectrum was highly valuable and expensive and maybe Small businesses, minorities, uh, women-owned groups could, you know, purchase smaller uh, geographic areas of spectrum and that sort of thing. And some of those ideas are still out there, but uh, that was that was a big focus back then. So I want to um, provide an additional perspective, and this perspective is not one to say to ignore the issues that Harold said or. Or, or, or in any way disagree with the, the ideas that um, Ruth mentioned about um, using funds you know, to, to, to deal with um, marginalized groups. And, um, but but I, just, I just want to step back and just look globally. How much mobile communications has contributed to the lives of people throughout the world? There are, you know, be, before you had mobile phones, most people, I think, in the world did not have any means of communications. And, and to have a phone in, in many countries, you know, you had to you know, wait 20 years, for, perhaps. And the mobile phones revolutionized uh, communications throughout the world and, and, and really was a case of, of the technology that lifted all boats. There were, there, were, there were people that had nothing in terms of uh, uh, communications. And, and now they can, you know, you, you, you can you know, call your relatives in the United States from, you know, from all over the world, places that I said there was no hope you would ever get a landline. And uh, it, it's, it's just been amazing um, uh, boom to many people throughout the world. And, you know, it's not only created economic growth, it's, 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 it's created, you know, true uh, welfare, you know, for, for all these people that are now able to communicate. 
So that's, that's and, and then I want to say something about the United States. Um, again, not diminishing you know, the, what we haven't done, but just looking at what has been achieved. You know, um, you know, smartphones have really led to the diffusion of, of um, internet access to many people that wouldn't have it otherwise. There, there are many people, I mean, there, there's a concern that, that uh, a you know, portion of the population doesn't have wired access in, you know, to the internet, but they do have access, which is something that without having you know, ubiquitous, affordable mobile services, they wouldn't have otherwise. And I think, I think that's a big deal. I think that has promoted um, you know, equity and um, is important. Not saying, you know, that, that we couldn't do better. But yeah. One one thing on just to echo what what Evan's saying. I mean, I do know there's you know obviously there's a lot of emphasis right now on broadband and broadband uh, connectivity, and um, you know a little bit surprised that you know because and if you look at I think some of the studies done by Pew and others, how many people are carrying these things. Um, and frankly, you know, whether it's the Lifeline program or the ACP program, um, the people that are getting access to the internet through this device, not through a wired connection, but through this thing. And, um, and you know, a lot of these people are dislocated, they're homeless, they're uh, disabled veterans. Um, this is, this is, um, something that I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that the administration isn't taking more notice of. Uh, there's a big focus on fiber and connectivity to the home, but this thing is connecting more people um, around the globe and in the US. And in some cases, it's the best connection uh, that people are gonna get. And I know um, the other th innovation that's come out of it too, you talk about, you know, using Spectrum wisely, and both T-Mobile and, and uh, Verizon are doing this, but the fixed wireless offerings. So what we're doing is, where we have uh, enough capacity, and this tends to be in rural areas, and it's always been an issue, going back to the day with the commission, that, you know, obviously there are fewer people in, in rural America, and maybe the spectrum isn't being used as much. So, an innovation that T-Mobile is using fixed wireless, um, you know, technology, especially in those rural uh, and exurban areas, uh, to offer broadband. We're actually the I think uh, Meredith didn't say our name, but we're the fastest growing broadband provider in the U.S. right now, and it's not through a wire, you know. So it is surprising to me that um, you know more of that isn't being understood because fiber is great, but you can't fiber the tractor. Uh, you can't, there are places that fiber is gonna take a long, long time to get to, that wireless will be there a hell of a lot sooner. So uh, I just wanna emphasize that, you know, in the legislation, the infrastructure bill, I know my team and others fought very hard for technology neutrality for broadband and, and there's a good reason for that. And, um, and that's something that as we roll out billions of dollars uh, you know, for fiber, I hope that people don't forget about wireless and, and understand that it can be a, a great solution in, in many instances. So that's, you know, um, one of the things I think we might want to uh, distinguish are what are sometimes thought of as social versus technical um, uh, programs in this area. So you know, when we talk about reallocating um, auction revenues for social purposes, we tend to think of that as more social. When we uh, um, talk about things like trying to develop a bidding credit uh, um, or even questions about uh, what are, you know, how much, uh, what's the, you know, size of a license area and what are, you know, is that going to include uh, 
um, you know, significant rural areas, or is it going to leave people behind? Those we tend to think is more technical. So, in terms of, and again, I, I acknowledge everything that folks have said that to some degree the rising tide lifts all boats was successful. Um, it did improve uh, lives, but also we, we can do better. But you know, asking you guys, you know, kind of thinking about it in terms of you know, what you might want to do differently today if you were looking at it. Do you think that it's really about the social programs that if you were doing the, you know, at the Spectrum Task Force, you might have uh, talked a little bit more about the USF for mobile or, uh, uh, you know, reallocating Spectrum revenue? Um, or, you know, is there a role for these kind of technical, um, you know, questions? Should we, you know, Think about uh, um, social equities uh, more when we're talking about things like the size of license areas um, or build out requirements in urban areas as well as in, uh, in rural areas as we move to a more small cell uh, environment. Yeah, I think that's part of what uh, I think is mandated in the infrastructure um, legislation and um, is going to be, uh, you know, is the focus of the commission's open proceeding on that and whether there are things that the commission can do um, and how how things are, are being rolled out, services are being rolled out. I do think, just to look back to, again, in 2002, this was flip phones, right? Uh, largely voice, very limited internet access. What came after this, in terms of, we were talking 3G, was 4G, was the whole app um, economy, okay? It didn't exist, and that was very transformative. I think it created, put, you know, in the hands of people, you know, very powerful uh, information and access. And, um, and, and I think also um, some of what's happened is also made the service more affordable. Um, and I think affordability, access, how, how some of this is deployed is always going to be an issue, I think, to try to you know, um, get service into the hands of those who need it most. Um, I have one or two more questions, but before we uh, do that, I want to uh, uh, give anybody in the audience uh, the opportunity to ask uh, any questions uh, of the panel uh, here. Okay, um, Lord knows I can go on. Um, but uh, so there have been other efforts to create um, a national spectrum policy. Um, I'd say probably the most successful was the PCAS report in 2012, um, which, uh, although that focused primarily on federal uh, uh, spectrum. Uh, we have not really, you know, as Meredith uh, alluded to, we have not really had a uh, um, an effort like the Spectrum Policy Task Force that has produced a national spectrum policy. Um, certainly not since uh, uh, 2012, and arguably even the PCAST report was more a uh, executive uh, branch uh, effort to uh, to try to deal with uh, a policy for federal spectrum in the face of increased uh, demand. So what, uh, first of all, kind of thinking through it, what impact do you think in the longer term the Spectrum Policy Task Force report as kind of the biggest effort that we've had uh, to do a purely national spectrum policy? Um, what do you think it's broader effects were and how they contributed to any of these other uh, efforts and why do you think that it's been so hard um, to uh, um, to replicate the uh, you know the success of the spectrum uh, policy task force in terms of uh, you know a purely spectrum focused uh, you know when national uh, policy and is this going to get Evan in trouble um, <laughs> No. No, because I don't have anything to say about it. 
So I think one of the useful things about the spectrum policy calculus was that, and you know, there's a lot of commission policy before and after. It's not like, you know, that was a, it's a moment frozen in time, but it builds on what came before and a lot of things build on it afterwards. Uh, it's, it's how to get away from the scarcity mentality of spectrum management. The, you know, one of the um, important, auctions are important. I think flexible use policy is actually much more important in terms of allowing spectrum to be used, to be moved to different uses to be repurposed. When you have a command and control uh, attitude towards spectrum, what you generally have in my experience is a lot of engineers thinking, okay, what can we fit, what else can we fit in this band? Uh, oh, this'll work and this'll work and, and it all works today. And what it doesn't do is exactly what Evan said, which is uh, anticipate what might happen in the future. And when you have that kind of incumbency, um, it can make it very difficult to repurpose spectrum. And that's one of the reasons why the economists uh, who came in and, and, and preached the value of flexible use and auctions and Evan and, and John Lou's paper on you should be, well, millions of Evan's papers, but all of Evan's papers, let us stipulate, but Evan's, uh, Evan and John Lou's paper in particular about being future oriented and anticipating that your inter interference environment might change because the adjacent uses might change. All that is a way of having a, a attitude towards spectrum that is, how do we make spectrum abundant? And that is, I think, what the PCAST report was one of the themes of the PCAST report. I will stop there. Well, I don't really have anything uh, monumental to add. I will say on the PCAST report, it will lead to the CBRS spectrum, which is still um, you know, yet to be fully utilized. Uh, and there, there's some you know, issues there with respect to neighboring power limits and, and that sort of thing. I will say some of the issues that come up don't always have to involve the FCC. In other words, a lot of times, there's a lot of interference issues every day, uh, for example, with carriers and uh, different users of spectrum that um, the licensees work out, you know, you know, either through reducing power or changing out equipment or other things. And so, um, you know, to the extent that the, the government can encourage that, I think it's harder when you're dealing with the Department of Defense because, you know, uh, they are the Department of Defense. But I think uh, particularly amongst commercial users, that's that sort of stuff is worked out all the time and uh, doesn't always necessarily require the FCC to, to engage. So thinking about uh, if we were going to try to put together another spectrum policy task force, um, one of the things that uh, I like to say about uh, uh, the FCC is when I talk to economists, they say that spectrum policy is really an economic problem, and they think it's an awful shame that lawyers and uh, uh, to some degree technologists have so much influence at the FCC. When I talk to engineers, they tell me that this is all really a technical problem, and they think that it's awful that lawyers and you know, to some degree economists have so much uh, influence. I'm a lawyer, so I think it works out pretty well. Uh, but uh, uh, looking at the Spectrum Task Force, there was an effort to balance not just from all parts of the agency, but also to bring in um, a, a, a reasonable balance of different disciplines um, to address these issues. Do you think that um, the FCC today um, is overbalanced in one direction or another. If we were going to try to do a, uh, um, a new spectrum task force, would it end up being dominated um, by you know, particular uh, disciplines? Um, and, uh, or do you think that uh, uh, the FCC still has a, you know, uh, a good uh, um, set of uh, 
folks from uh, all of these uh, disciplines. And what additional disciplines do you think might be valuable? I mean, is it something where we might want to include, say, urban planners um, or uh, other uh, um, folks who could contribute a different uh, perspective to building a, uh, um, a you know, productive uh, policy task force? I'm a lawyer, so I'm a little bit biased, but, uh, and it's good we have an economist on the panel, because Ruth's a lawyer too, but we don't have an engineer. Is there an engineer in the room? But <laughs> I do think, and when I was at the FCC, it was really, I think, great to have the economists, the engineers, and the lawyers in the room talking together. You know? And I actually credit Reed Hunt a lot with this, because I don't think there were many economists at the FCC. Uh, until he arrived, I mean, he really mandated that we needed to have more economic thinking going into our policy making at the FCC at the time. And so I do think uh, it's really important to have, I think, you know, lawyers do tend to dominate at the FCC, but I do think uh, it's really important to have the thinking of engineers, the thinking of economists, and, and others. I mean, I think, um, you know, I don't know about the urban planning idea, maybe. Um, or any other disciplines that we might be yeah, that we might be missing in terms of how we, yeah, uh, you know, is this a problem that now has, you know, a, a a sociology future, type elements? Or, a you know, kind of futurist like might be a good idea. I, you know, I, you know, I'll never forget listening to Dale Hatfield uh, as a young attorney. He used to teach a class, and him talking about. And this was before there was auctions, talking about mobile technology and, and describing what he thought was coming down the pike. And I remember being just amazed. And so, you know, if there's a limitation sometimes in the government, you tend to only look at what's in front of you. And sometimes you're not thinking, thinking ahead. Nobody anticipated in 2002, like the app economy, nobody anticipated that uh, mobile technology was going to be you know, your primary entry point to the to the internet and that that would have all sorts of other ramifications. Harold and I were talking about privacy, for example, nowhere on the radar screen at that time. So I don't know if you can hire people who can think to the future, but to the extent you can have that, that futurist thinking inside the agency, I think it might lead to some interesting policy developments. Would we want to have a panel of science fiction writers to uh, come and talk to the FCC, for example? Uh, so I think that you know there's still a ton of engineers at the FCC and at NTIA. I think both agencies are um, trying to recruit more engineers, and and I I think that would be helpful. And I didn't I, I, when I I don't take what I said before to mean that I'm denigrating engineers. They're, they are the core of the FCC's um, policy making. They're the, you know, it's a licensing agency. They do a lot of the licensing. But I was remarking on this, the tension that I saw sometimes between the engineers and the economists. Um, I would put in a plug for more GIS trained people. Uh, when, when we had Mike Byrne and I, no, I've forgotten the name of the guy that worked with him. Eric. Eric, yeah. Uh, was it, you know what we referred to Mike Byrne as the mapping guy and he said he was really into you know what he really was doing was helping with data visualization for policy making but they, he was so oversubscribed it was just as soon as people realized the value of maps both for uh, people in the you know people who are trying to buy spectrum or comment on proceedings or just see whether where they had broadband service they, um, the, the demands on, on no time were incredible, and I think that is something that's just gonna become more important over time. So, last question, um, and I'm gonna take one answer off the table, which means, you know, um, I'm sorry, Evan, did you wanna? Uh, no, I'm just saying that we are hiring more GIS for people. Yeah. So, 
Last question, and I'm gonna take an answer off the table before I ask it. We need more spectrum is not an acceptable answer for this question. <laughs> Other than that, what is, do you think, the biggest policy issue uh, in spectrum uh, today? Well, from my perspective, I think uh, just the interaction with government users of spectrum is a big deal. And uh, you know, the government users of spectrum don't tend to be, use the most efficient technology. I saw, we saw that, T-Mobile saw that when we cleared the AWS spectrum and you had all these government users, DHS and others using analog spectrum uh, that really wasted a lot of megahertz. So I think uh, driving more efficiency in the use of government spectrum and uh, you know, more interaction with, uh, positive interaction with government uh, on spectrum management, I think would be, would be an important development. I agree. And, uh, <laughs> I must say that I can't help but, but um, go where you tend not to, which is you know continuing to reallocate spectrum for higher value uses. Um, it's not like we get more spectrum; it's just we're moving spectrum from either unused or lower value um, uh, uses, and I, I, I think that's um, critical. And as um, Kevin is, uh, has said. Um, you know, the FCC has pretty much uh, emptied the cupboard at the moment, and um, that we need to look to the, the, the government and, and, and PIA. But in addition to, to, to that issue, which I think is always the, the, the central issue, and I'll, I'll go back to stuff that we've already talked about, which is you know forward-looking regulation, and, and the, the biggest example, which and we've mentioned has to do with uh, um, interference, uh, dealing in, in, a, in a smarter way with interference. And, and, when, when, and when, let me just note uh, on the interference issue. You know, interference is not just about better receivers. It's about you know, the entire system design. Uh, and you know, th this is something that John Williams taught me. So you don't want to, I mean, one of the problems with receiver standards this is just dealing, I mean, besides the fact that it's, it's often too blunt and you don't give enough flexibility, you know, to, to but th there, are, there are trade offs in system design, and I'm not the best one to, to, to talk about it, but in terms of being susceptible to interference, there, there are multiple ways that, that you can address it. You possibly can increase the power, you, you can increase the average power level throughout the entire um, service area. So. So that you don't have a problem that they have interference because the, the desired signal is, is weak because you're so far away. Um, there, there are other measures that, that um, you know, that what John and I call self-protection. You, you can have um, non-mandated uh, frequency cord bands, and you can have non-mandated uh, um, geographic, um, uh, you know, zone setbacks to to. Um, uh, uh, avoid uh, interference. So, you know, ideally we would, we would like to provide incentives to let the parties that are receiving interference figure out what the best way to mitigate it is, but not to expect that they're always going to be able to coexist with what was when they first got their allocation, but, you know, to a higher, um, a, a more challenging interference environment but you know, if they don't do that, it's their problem. You know, so, so, and, and, but one of the, so, so interference, you know, I think is a big issue, is, is like my number one issue after more spectrum. And let me just, on the interference thing, I think John and I have a good idea how we would deal with providing incentives for system operators where they, you know, you're controlling the whole system design. But we don't have a good answer to the question of how you would have dealt with you know, GPS or, or altimeters. Uh, those, those are very difficult. And you know, at the moment, I, 
you know, the best we have is some kind of you know standards, minimum requirements, something. But but there there isn't a system um, um, operator that 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 can be given an incentive to make that stuff all work. And so we, we, we don't have a good solution except the sort of traditional um, you know, standard, if, if there, the most flexible standard that you can have. You know, it can be a performance standard, not a design standard, but um, that, that, that's something I'd like help on, you know, how, how to figure that out. So I would just vote for continuing to expand the tool set for repurposing spectrum. I think that's what CBRS was about. The, the um, spectrum task force report talks about unlicensed spectrum and exclusive use spectrum, CBRS. The CBRS policies were an effort to be creative and look for something that was in between so that it could be a, uh, a spectrum of, of so um, I'd like to see more ideas like that um, come to the front and be tried at least in some days. One other thing I'll just mention too is I think um, enforcing build out, you know, making sure people are utilizing the spectrum that's been licensed to them, I think is a, is a big issue too. The commission very rarely uh, takes spectrum back uh, that isn't being fully utilized. And uh, so that is something too that I think the commission could be uh, a little stronger on. So I wanna thank our panel and ask everyone else here to uh, uh, thank uh, our panel as we uh, had our uh, uh, to jump back to the exciting year of 2002 and uh, you know, look ahead to, to what we ought to be doing 20 years later. So thank you all for participating. Thank you very much.